Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Um, so I am going to be talking more about nuclear engineering uh, to you guys today. And the title of this talk is similar to what the title of my dissertation was. But I'm going to talk about a subset of my dissertation, which I think may be more applicable to the audience that's here today. Um, the, the authors on the talk are my advisor, Marvin Adams, and then Mihai Anitescu, who is a staff member at Argonne National Lab and who has mentored several CSGFers through their practicums. And uh, he's the one that kind of got me started down this path. So the problem we are trying to solve is, is what we call a, a uh, depletion perturbation problem. And big picture, what we're doing is solving some engineering system that's going to give us an answer to some design problem we have. And then we want to know, you know not, not only what is that answer, but how sensitive is that answer to the uncertain parameters that feed, in, feed into the simulation. And we attack that problem with an adjoint-based technique, which I'll describe in a little more detail as we go through. Uh, but, but the big picture is, that, of course, we, excuse me, we solve a forward problem, which in our case is a uh, transport equation, which gives the, uh, the solution to the transport equation is the neutron flux shape, which I'll call uh, psi throughout the, the talk today. And that's basically just telling you how many neutrons are moving in a certain direction at a certain time with a certain energy. Coupled to that uh, transport equation is a material balance equation. And this is going to give, the solution to this equation gives the densities at a certain point in time. And those densities could be, for example, the uh, actinides that, that Leslie spoke about in the previous talk. So solve these equations. They're, they're nonlinear and they're coupled. And then compute some quantity of interest, which uh, could be how much waste did this reactor produce, or what's the power profile at, at the end of life, or how long did the reactor last before, before we had to shut down to refuel. So that's the forward problem. Then we turn around and we solve an adjoint problem. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a couple of slides, but it's, the adjoint problem is mathematically related to the forward problem. It's, uh, it, it's coupled to the formulation of the forward problem. And a key feature of it, and something that's going to be important for what I'm going to talk about today, is that it's solved backwards in time for adjoint variables, psi dagger, and n dagger. And uh, the fact that we have to solve it backwards in time introduces some computational challenges, which uh, is kind of the point of the schemes that I'm going to talk about in this talk. OK, so step one, solve the forward problem. Step two, solve the adjoint problem. And then step three, per perform uncertainty quantification calculations. And the big one is, what is the sensitivity of our QOI with respect to a list of uncertain parameters, which I call P? And those uncertain parameters can be anything that's input to the code that maybe you don't know for sure, like material properties, uh, coefficients and empirical correlations, things like that. So th the advantage of the adjoint technique is that the cost of computing dqdp does not grow rapidly with the length of p. So in other words, you can get this full gradient of q with respect to p for a cost that does not grow as you add to the spectra p, which is different than if you're going to use, say, a finite difference approach, where that would grow linearly with the length of p. So that's big picture why we're choosing to do an adjoint technique. And that's important because our target is very large systems, so lots of unknowns in the forward problem, lots of p's, many uh, Many parameters go into these nuclear engineering calculations. And then we want to think about how we're going to do these problems on advanced architectures. OK, so here's, for those of you that like equations more than words, here's the, uh, an example forward problem. So suppose we're using explicit time stepping to go forward. So uh, given an initial condition for the densities, maybe we advance the densities in time with an explicit time step. And then solve a steady state transport equation to update the, new, uh, the neutron flux. And the, the transport operator H depends on the solution to the material balance equation N and vice versa. So these are uh, nonlinear equations that we, that we have to advance through time. And then at the end of the day, we're interested in a QOI that, for this simple example, depends only on the solution at T equals TF. And that QOI, I write like this. It's some integrated functional of the solution. And our goal, again, is to compute dQdp for every P. So this slide kind of introduces the point of, of the schemes that I'm going to talk about today. So the adjoint problem that leads to dQdp, uh, so the adjoint problem that leads to this, this gradient vector is, has this form right here. I'm not going to go through these term by term, but you'll see that, that there is an adjoint material balance equation that kind of corresponds to the forward material balance equation. There's an adjoint transport equation that corresponds to the forward transport equation. And then there's a terminal condition. So this thing is kicked off 
at t equals tf and to solve backwards to t equals t0. But the key thing here is that at every time step, when we need to evaluate these terms that are in the adjoint equation, we need access to that forward solution. So the adjoint equations are kind of linearized about the forward, uh, the forward problem. So the question is, how can we efficiently access the forward solution in order to, ter in order to form these terms that are in the adjoint equations? And the, the, the broad name given to algorithms that do this is called checkpointing schemes. And, and again, the point of the checkpointing scheme is to, is to efficiently provide access to the forward solution during the adjoint solve. So you might think, okay, that's easy. Just store the whole forward solution and then as you're marching backwards in time, it'll be sitting there in RAM and you can, and you can grab it when you need it. But it's very easy to imagine a problem that, that quickly overruns the available memory on a machine. Uh, so, so imagine we're on DOE Sequoia with 16 cores per node and 16 gigabytes of RAM per node. And we're gonna try to put this many unknowns on a node in order to solve a reactor problem. So you know, this, for this example, that comes out to 400 million unknowns. This is a moderately high fidelity reactor problem. So that's 3.2 gigabytes of data just to save a snapshot of this angular flux vector. And we're gonna need 1,000 of them or something, 1,000 time steps. So there's no way we're gonna be able to store this in RAM and then just use it during the adjoint solve. And moreover, the future does not bode well for an approach where you're just gonna to try to store everything because we're headed to extreme CPU counts, decreasing RAM availability, and expensive I.O. So we're trying to think about how to solve this problem on advanced architectures. So it, big picture, the general checkpoint strategy is as follows. So you march through, a forward, march through the forward problem and at predetermined uh, time steps, you save a snapshot of that forward problem to file. And then you turn around and you start working in adjoint mode. And, when you, and then when you get back to where you saved a copy of the forward solution, you read it back into RAM, recompute some of that forward problem, and save it in RAM as much as you can afford, basically. And then march through that point in adjoint mode and then repeat until you get back to t equals t0. So I'm gonna talk about how we've adapted this to be a little more efficient. And in order to do that, I've gotta explain a little bit about how we solve this transport equation. Uh, so, so this is a simple form of a transport equation. There's a, there's a transport term, a total collision term, and then a total source term. And that source term depends on the solution uh, uh, psi. So what we do is we, we iterate, and at, at each iteration, we just update the source term, compute a new psi vector, and repeat until there's some kind of convergence. And each one of these iterations is called a sweep. But the key thing is, it, it's common in nuclear engineering to represent the angular dependence of this right-hand side in terms of some polynomial expansion. So instead of saving point values and angle, we save, uh, we save coefficients and, and functions that, that represent an expansion. And what that, at the end of the day, what that does is, is makes it so we don't have to save as much information about the angular dependence of psi. We just save it in terms of an expansion that, uh, after so many terms, converges to that angular dependence. And so that's, that's what we're gonna to leverage to do these checkpointing schemes. So the new schemes are going to checkpoint, i.e. write to file, write to RAM, read from file, these converged source moments, or these coefficients that are in this polynomial expansion, instead of reading and writing the full angular flux vector. So that reduces the RAM footprint and the file I.O. loads, because typically the number of moments to represent the number of angles, the number of moments used to represent the angular dependence is much less than the number of angles. So we have to save less information. The cost of doing that is that when we need psi, the full angular flux vector to compute a term in the adjoint equation, the cost is a full uh, sweep, which is just a repeat of the last source iteration scheme, a repeat of the last iterate of the source iteration scheme. So at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're, we're, paying, in, we're paying flops for less memory and I.O. Uh, costs, which is kind of what the machines are doing. Flops are becoming more and more uh, available. Memory and I.O. is becoming more and more expensive. So I'm gonna go through a series of schemes and I'm gonna use these symbols to kind of represent what's going on in these schemes. So the, the boxes are uh, FFS and AFS. That's a forward fixed source solve and an adjoint fixed source solve. And, and that's the bulk of the computing uh, cost that, that goes into these algorithms. And then FSW is a, is a single sweep. So remember there's maybe a couple hundred sweeps per full fixed source solve. Uh, so, so these sweeps are computationally less expensive than doing the full solve. And then the circle guys have to do with, with memory operations. So the, uh, the red circle is 
with SA in it is, that's the cost to store the angular flux to RAM. With SM in it is, is the cost to store the source moments to RAM, that lower order representation. And then these guys are, are reading and writing those data from file. Uh, so, so that's what these symbols are going to mean as I march through these schemes. Okay, so the most naive checkpoint scheme is, is again, where you just store everything as you march through the forward problem. Uh, so, so here we go in forward mode. We're marching through. At every time step, we have to do a forward fixed source solve. We save the full angular flux vector to RAM. And then when we get to the end, we turn around and we start marching backwards in adjoint mode. And at each time step in adjoint mode, we don't need to do anything to recover the forward solution because it's already sitting in RAM. So we just do the adjoint fixed source solve and move on to the next time step. A simple adaptation there is to now, instead of storing the full angular flux vector at each time step, we're going to store these source moments. So the difference is, again, in forward mode, we march through, we do a forward fixed source solve at every time step, store those source moments at every time step. And the difference is, when we turn around now and go in adjoint mode, at each time step, we have to perform a forward sweep. So the cost here is an extra forward sweep to prepare for each adjoint fixed source solve. Uh, but the benefit is that these the memory footprint of these guys is much, much less than the memory footprint of the full angular flux vector. Okay, now there's two schemes that, that read and write to file. So, uh, so this scheme called checkpoint all mode, uh, we march through in forward mode, and then every now and then during forward mode, we write the full angular flux vector to file. And then when we turn around and start marching in adjoint mode, we get to this recompute chunk. What we do is we pause the forward, we, we pause the adjoint solver, read in the angular flux vector, kick off a so many time steps of forward mode, and at each time step save the full angular flux vector, and then march backwards through adjoint mode and, and compute the adjoint solution uh, over that recompute segment. So uh, here in adjoint mode, there's no cost to recover the forward solution because we've saved everything in RAM during the recompute chunk. Okay, so the logical extension to the checkpoint mode, uh, here now in recompute mode, we read in the moments, store them to RAM. So this storing the moments is, is lower cost than storing the angular flux vector. March through the forward problem, and then during adjoint mode, we again have to compute these forward sweeps before we compute uh, the adjoint solution to recover the forward solution. So to kind of summarize all this, um, I kind of outlined the recompute fixed source solve cost and the RAM footprint of each scheme. And uh, so K times NR is the total number of time steps, and these are how these things scale uh, for, for each of these schemes. So the store guys don't have any recompute fixed source solve except for a few sweeps, which I'm not including in this table. But they have memory footprints that scale with the total number of time steps. On the other hand, the checkpoint schemes have some recompute fixed source solves uh, cost, uh, but the RAM footprints only scale with the size of the recompute chunk. And the, they scale linearly with that size, and the coefficient of that linear uh, scaling for the checkpoint all mode is the cost to store the full angular flux vector, as opposed to just storing the angular source moments in this other mode, checkpoint mode. OK, so I'm just going to breeze through some results. So what we did was we dreamed up a problem that doesn't have a, whole, a very high unknown density, but we want to show that uh, we want to show that we can first get the same solution with either scheme, show that indeed we incur a lower memory cost, and we don't impact the time to solution. So in other words, we can show that using these schemes, we can get a bigger problem on the machine at the same cost. So I'm going to show results from, I think, is it eight different schemes on three different processor counts and three different memory, uh, three different number of unknowns per CPU. OK, so the chart on the left is the RAM footprint of those eight schemes for this particular problem. And, and again, it's not a very big problem. It's only, so the, the largest RAM footprint is only 26 megabytes. Uh, but you can see that the schemes that only checkpoint angular source moments have a much lower memory footprint. And that memory footprint, the, the ratio of, of one to the other is basically the size of the recompute chunk. So there's, there's very large memory savings here that would scale to larger problems. And then this uh, plot shows the time to solution for each of those schemes. So the guys that don't have to do any recomputing take less time. But there's basically no difference between storing everything and storing just the source moments because the extra flop cost is, is only a few forward sweeps. And then in, uh, the guys that write to file, uh, again, there's, there's no penalty for performing those extra few sweeps compared to the penalty that you're paying by reading and writing and storing full angular flux vectors. So that's the takeaway here, basically, is, is that uh, we have a lower RAM footprint, but we didn't impact the time to solution. And 
I, I of course, have other results. I decided not to show them to talk about some of the stuff upstream of the results. Uh, but, but basically, to summarize, we, we eliminate the need to store many copies of Psi. And by many, I mean something that scales with the size of these recompute chunks by just checkpointing these converged source moments. And what that does is reduce the memory footprint of the algorithm at the cost of extra flops, but that's OK, because that's kind of where machines are going anyways. So the scaling results show that we don't impact the time to solution. Uh, essentially, we can, we can get a bigger problem on the machine. And the, in general, the nuclear engineering problems scale. The more unknowns you can get on a processor, the better. So we can get a bigger problem on the machine and, and increase our, our time to, or decrease our time to solution. So questions and discussion, I'd be happy to take any questions you have. I do want to thank the CSGF program for opening doors and leading me down a path that, that I didn't even know existed before I started here. And, and also, uh, in collaboration with Mihai, some of the funding was from this uh, Caesar Center. It's an exascale center funded by DOE. Thank you.